Shalom, Chavrim. I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching the Noon Institute of Biblical Research. And I have a message I wanted to share with you about the uh, horse riders of Revelation. Might say rider in this case because the only thing that is in the plural really is the horses. We have different horses, different colors there. Uh, but the rider seems to be the same man all the time. Anyway, if you would, take your Bible with me. We're going to start in the book of Joshua. Very unusual place maybe to start with the horse and his rider, but I think it's very appropriate, uh, and I think you'll understand why as we go through this here. In Joshua chapter 24, we'll begin with verse 2. Joshua said to all the people, Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, from ancient times your fathers lived beyond the river, namely Terah, the father of Abraham, and the father of Nahor, and they served other gods. Then I took your father Abraham from beyond the river, and led him through all the land of Canaan, and multiplied his descendants, and gave him Isaac. To Isaac I gave Jacob and Esau, and Esau I gave Mount Seir to possess it. To possess it. But Jacob and his sons went down to Egypt. It's kind of interesting. Esau actually took what God gave him, but it took a while for the children of uh, Jacob to come around to where God had given them. Then I sent Moses and Aaron, and I plagued Egypt by what I did in, in, in its midst. And afterwards I brought you out, I brought your fathers out of Egypt, and you came to the sea, and Egypt pursued your fathers, which chariots, with, excuse me, with chariots and horsemen to the Red Sea. But when they cried out to the Lord, he put darkness between you and the Egyptians, and brought the sea upon them, and covered them, and your own eyes saw what I did in Egypt. Interesting, isn't it? Again, as we say here, the reason why I'm bringing out this part in Joshua, Joshua is recounting the horse and the rider, but in this case, Joshua is speaking about the horsemen uh, that came. He's speaking of it in the plural. But we find an interesting thing in the book of Exodus, something I've shared with you in time past, Exodus 15, where Moses sings this interesting song to the children of Israel. And it's more interesting the way it starts out. He says, Az Yashem Moshe Uvene Yisrael. Then Moses uh, and the sons of Israel, uh, et, uh, uh, excuse me, they sing this song, Et Chashirah Hazot Ladonai Veyomer Lemor. And they sing this song into the Lord. And this is what the song says. I will sing. Now that's a, one person is going to sing, and that's Moses. That's kind of interesting in itself. I will sing. See, a singular. Now the, all of Israel sings this song, but when the song is being sung, the song is being sung about Moses and him alone. Asherah, I will sing Ladonai unto the Lord, Ki go ga'ah, for he has, um, for he has highly exalted, Sus ve'ekevora mabeyom, the horse and his rider has he thrown into the sea or hurled into the sea. One horse and one rider. And as Rashi, the great Torah commentator from back about a thousand years ago pointed out, from this very song in Exodus that no doubt Moses must return because Moses sings of this as a future event that he will get victory over the horse and over his rider. Those of you that have followed this ministry for some time know that I've always stood for the return of Moses as one of the two witnesses and this is the overcoming of the Antichrist spirit. Now, there's something interesting though because when we look at the book of Revelation, when we look at Babylon, we look at Jeremiah 51, there's a lot of people that believe that the United States is Babylon. And yes, this is partly true as well. But there's a little slight difference scripturally. Why is the United States part of Babylon in this case? It's because the U.S. are the Roman soldiers for the Vatican, which is truly the head of Babylon. So anyway... Let's, I, I wanted to bring this out. And the reason I'm bringing that out is because going back here to Joshua, we see here that when he speaks about the horses 
the horsemen coming down and their riders, God takes when they cry out to him, he puts a darkness between the two. And kind of in a similitude, when the, when the Christian people, the early Christians that wanted to break away from the Catholic Church many years ago, several hundred years ago, in fact, they wanted to get freedom of religion, they came across the sea, just like the children of Israel crossed the sea in order to escape the Pharaoh of their day, the true Christians that were trying, the early pilgrims that wanted to escape the Roman Catholic Church for freedom of religion, they also had to cross a sea. And isn't it interesting, just as a thought, that in the case of the children of Israel, there was darkness put between them and the Egyptians. Well, God did kind of the same thing for those that want to escape Rome. And by the way, Rome is referred to many times in scriptures as Egypt. And just as when they killed our Lord, the Bible says that spiritually speaking, the dead bodies of the two witnesses will lay in the street spiritually called Sodom and Egypt. Now, that's another interesting fact right there. Why does the scripture call the place where the Lord is being crucified or where the two witnesses will die Sodom and Egypt? It was pretty obvious from looking at the news today that Jerusalem has become a Sodomite city. Once a holy city of God has become a Sodomite city. Now the government allows gay parades there in Jerusalem. Despicable, the 13th annual gay parade that just took place right before the High Holy Days. And of course, there was a Haredi Jewish man that had been released from prison that stabs a bunch of them in the process. I do not condone the stabbing of these people regardless because the word of God says, Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. He will repay for the evils that are being done there. But I do hold the government of Israel accountable for the mere fact that they've even allowed such. If anything, these people need help. But it's called Sodom because of the Sodomites that have come into Jerusalem that have been allowed to be there. It should be banned from the city. It's one thing that we might give an applaud for Vladimir Putin. He does not allow gay people in his military. I'm not against the person. I'm against the sin. In fact, if you go to look in the, in the book of Adam and Eve, we find out that when, when the, uh, the evils that were coming upon the earth before the destruction of the time of, of Noah's day, that it also spoke of a time where men were looking upon men, and it speaks about how that they would uh, be in the face and put their foreheads together, the sodomite way. It also speaks about that the women would be tattooed up into their neck and faces, and what do we see today? The same thing that happened in the days of Noah are happening once again today. Very interesting to say the least. But Egypt, the reason it's called Egypt is because the Pharaoh of Egypt or the Pope of Rome, who is no more than an Egyptian prince because he is uh, the descendant of Hadad, Hadad being a descendant of, uh, of the royal line of Esau. He is a descendant of that royal line of Esau. And he was raised in the house of Pharaoh, just like Moses was, as a prince of Egypt. He goes forth, becomes uh, a king of Syria, and then later migrates into northern Africa, according to the Jewish uh, writings that they have on that. And, of course, Obadiah the prophet declares that Edom, Esau's descendants, are in Rome. And they were the ones that took part in the destruction of the temple, clearly identified in the book of Obadiah, which was Titus, the Roman general. So anyway, we come here and we see, though, that this darkness was put between the children of Israel when they came down to the Red Sea and the horsemen of the pharaohs of Egypt. And the same thing when the early Christians that wanted freedom of religion, that wanted to get out from under the Vatican's control, came to America. When they came here for freedom of religion, God separated between the two countries, darkness. Because on one side of the earth is daylight and the other side it's darkness. 
because of the time zone. I just thought that was kind of interesting. Don't want to make a doctrine out of that, but it's very interesting. Anyway, we go on down here. I'd like to just show you something quickly, though, before we move out of the book of Joshua, something that you may not have noticed before. Normally, when we think about the battle of Jericho, we think that Joshua goes down there. They're just scared people, and Joshua goes down there and destroys all of them, and it kind of puts, makes God look like just... Uh, bloodthirsty person to go out and kill a bunch of people. But we find here in this particular passage, in verse 11 of chapter 24, it says, You crossed the Jordan and came to Jericho, and the citizens of Jericho fought against you, and the Amorite, and the Perizzite, and the Canaanite, and the Hittite, and the uh, Gergesite, and the Hivite, and the Jebusite. Thus I gave them unto your hand. It's just kind of interesting that God actually shows they started the fight. God delivered them to the children of Israel. We don't see that in the beginning of Joshua, but we find it out here, that one little insight there. I thought that was just kind of interesting. All right, from here, let's take, I want to take you to the book of Revelation, though, and we're going to quickly take a look at um, the horse rider there in the book of Revelation. I've had many people in the past ask me what I speak on the book of Revelation. I, I, I have briefly in some places, um, two witnesses, things of that nature there, but I haven't gotten into it a whole lot. And uh, I think maybe we probably will more as time goes on. In chapter 6 of Revelation, it's the seals that we're wanting to look at here. It says, And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, uh, that's chapter 6, verse 1, And I heard, as it were, the noise of a thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. Now, I know in early Christianity, some of the uh, people actually believed that this was Yeshua, but it's not. It's clearly the Antichrist uh, who is riding on a white horse, who is the Antichristo, the substitute for Yeshua, the one that is claiming to be the Christ when he's really not. He's going forth conquering and to conquer. And what does the Antichrist use? He uses the world militaries that are under his dictator command. That's the NATO forces of today. These are the Roman soldiers. Uh, as I mentioned to you in one of the other books that we had read, that I forget which one it was, though, but it speaks about that this king of the south would rise up and that he would be in power, but he would bankrupt the world economy through the, through the, because of the wages of his Roman soldiers. Now see, that is just a very interesting uh, uh, thing to see about, because why? It shows the king of the south, I happen to believe that very well, well, very well may be Pope Francis, uh, because he comes from Argentina. And he rises up, and of course his Roman soldiers are the United States and NATO and their allies there. And of course this is what is bringing the world economy to ruins as all the wages that have to be paid. Of course the Pope of Rome doesn't finance these wars. He makes those nations finance them for him. Anyway, in the second seal, he says, When he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see, and there went out... Uh, another horse that was red and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth and they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. You know, one of the things that came to my heart when I looked at this was that taking peace from the earth that they kill one another. Now again, the writer is the Vatican. It's the Pope of Rome. It's really the Satan is who it is on there, but it's Satan pushing the buttons of that Pope to get these things going on. Now, they, in this case, though, this blood comes up. They fight against one another. Now, is that wars on the earth, or could that be civil war? And notice on the earth today, the civil wars in Syria, they fight against each other. In Iraq, they fight against each other. In the United States, they're bringing on a civil unrest, the black people against the white people. And I know firsthand account from people from the Obama administration, it's what they desire to do so that they have a reason to declare martial law. And when they declare martial law, they can disarm the nation. That was really the pretext behind it. Because the United Nations sent a letter to Barack Obama wanting to know how, what, was, what was his way that he was going to disarm the nation. Because to come under the UN uh, agreement there, it must be done this way. 
It's what the Pope of Rome wants. He wants a defenseless nation. He wants to take away the rights of the American people. And they've looked for all kinds of ways to incite violence. The, they use the police to attack the black people and, and to, to, to uh, uh, appalling things. And by the way, my black brothers and sisters, I might say to you, I, I've seen it before from my own eyes. They'll do the same thing to a white person. In fact, I saw recently a, a, a chart that was laid out showing the crimes that are committed against the different races in the United States by the police. It was a, a chart about that. And surprisingly, the white people were the highest group in there, 37%. The black people were a smaller number, but that would stand to reason as well because the, the, it's, it's a much larger population amongst the white, uh, the white people in America. And then, of course, they had the Hispanic, which was a very small number that was, that was abused and uh, beaten by police. But nonetheless, the atrocities that are happening to the black people in America at the hands of the police, it's clearly a police state, without a doubt. And of course, now we see that the white extremists are burning the, the churches in America. What is all this about? The United States is good about finding ways to, to bring civil strife and civil war. But it's really not the United States. It's the Vatican that wants these things to happen. Oh, they claim to be peace. They say peace, peace. But there is no peace, the Bible said. When they're claiming peace, God says there is no peace. Look what happened over in Ukraine. And on the documentary that the Russian uh, government put together, uh, President Putin puts the documentary together with his, with his team over there, and they clearly show the evidence they had intercepted phone calls between certain groups and the American embassy there trying to build the unrest. They brought a neo-Nazi group in that hated Russians to murder them. And so created a civil war where they hate each other and fight and kill one another. But it's coming to the American border as well, very soon. And I only, I, only I, I, I beg of you, my Christian friends, both the black Christian friends and the white Christian friends, love one another. Do not get a part of this evil and talk to the people. Try to win everyone that you can to Christ because if you're, if you're in unity in the love of Yeshua, you would not be a part of this. And the white man of America, I say to you, your black brother is not against you. You have to look deeper at the source. And it's Satan that is the source of this. And he's using the Pope of Rome. And then the Pope of Rome, they use the Jesuits. Of course, we have a Jesuit Pope up there to begin with. What do you expect? Him all dressed in white, you know, <laughs> believe me, that... That doesn't matter. That's only showing that he is that anti, the vicar of Christ. The Latin translation for antichristo is vicar of Christ, as I brought out before. All right, so anyway, we see here in Revelation here, we go back here to the, that's the second seal. See, and they, you notice again, we look at that, the power given him that they set their own, take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another. That's civil war. He's not showing a conquering. They kill one another. Mm. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard a, the third beast say, Come and see, and I beheld, and lo, a black horse, and he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts saying, A measure of wheat for a penny, and a measure of barley for a penny, and see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. Now you're going to have to, you know, it's the buying and the selling. And that just really reminds me. Because see, the fourth beast say, see, he said, I heard a voice in the heaven, miss the beast say, come and see a measure of wheat for a penny and, and three measures of barley for a penny and see thou hurt not the, the wine and the oil. Mm. Mm. I have a feeling that this is going to have a lot to do with um, the buying and selling. A lot to do with the Antichrist system. You know, in the, one of the apocalypses as well, in the apocryphal writings there, that talk about after the collapsing of the economic system, that uh, the, the king that does this will then take and confiscate the money and do a redistribution of wealth. 
Pope Francis is calling upon this already. A redistribution of wealth. And that's because they have bankrupt the economy. It also says that there would be an abundance of food, but no one would be able to buy it because the currency will be valueless. And we're kind of seeing this right here. You're, you're, it's being allotted out in measurements. At any rate, um, let's move on here. The fourth seal, when he had opened the, the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see, and behold, I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was death, and hell followed him, and power was given unto him over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword and with hunger and with death, and the beast of uh, and with the beast of the earth. That's interesting there. See, that's what I was talking about. When you look at that second horse, the, the, the power is given that, there, that there's war between, between each other. Civil war. But when you get down here to the fourth seal and the pale horse, now he's given power. See, he's given power of the fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword. Now he does it by his military power. See? And with hunger and with death. Interesting, isn't it? And with, and, and notice, and with the beast of the earth. I could tell you some things right there. You know, there's a, there is a, um, gosh, I wish I could remember where this is at. There is a passage uh, that speaks about, um, let me just see if I wrote it here in my notes anywhere there. Um, oh, yes, here it is. This is actually in the Apocalypse of Abraham. You know, there, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of books like this. And in the Dead Sea Scrolls, many of these books are actually in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, I don't remember if the Apocalypse of Abraham is, is mentioned on that. I'd have to go back and look that up to, to verify that. But in chapter 30 of verse 12 in the Apocalypse of Abraham, he actually states in there, the wild beast will be their grave. This is when he's talking about the things that will happen in the last days on the earth. And that was the one that I noted because I remembered that in the book of Revelation that it spoke about, um, uh, there again in the fourth seal, that uh, that you know there, that there's this that there's, uh, that that hell follows with him, uh, and power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth. This is where I believe that this CERN may end up opening up the portals of hell to not. We already know the devils are on the earth as it is, but there's also demons that, demons that have been bound at the river Euphrates. And I believe that this portal that may, you know, it could be that CERN is what opens up that portal to bring these demons in. And they may just go on people like the, like when Yeshua, when, when, the, when the man that was uh, vexed with all these devils, he said he wanted to be set free. And Yeshua, he got ready to cast the demons out. The demons said, sir, for us to go into the swine. Well, he let them go into the swine. Well, the swine were smart enough to go kill themselves, you know, after they got possessed of all these demons. And, uh, but anyway, uh, the same thing here, we see that the, that the power is given them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with a sword and with hunger and with death and with the beast of the earth. See, the animals of the earth. Do you know that this is what happened in the time? This was part of the plagues during the time of Moses when Aaron and Moses came down. One of the places speak of there in the plagues that the, that the beast of the earth came in. You know, the wild beast It's totally separate. It's not the locust. It's not the... Uh, the hell or any of that, but it's actually the beast. And if you look in the book of Jasher, it goes a little bit more in detail about that because it is written in the, uh, in the book of Exodus when this happens. Uh, it speaks about the wild animals that, were, that came into Egypt. But do you think the wild animals that came into Egypt were just there for, you know, hey, how you doing and pet me and stuff? They came in there ravaging the people. Because everything that came in was ravaging the land. When the locusts came in, they ate all the green vegetation. When the animals came in, they were doing to the people there in Egypt, as it will happen in the last days, as Abraham writes here, that they will make their, that, that the beast will be their grave. Why do you think God allows that in the first place? Why do you think these things are coming on this earth? It has a lot to do with the evils that have been done to all the nature all the animals that are on the earth. You know, let me share, share something with you. And I know there's a lot of people that don't like to hear these things, but you need to be aware of some of these things. Um, 
And you know, I, I realize we have a lot of scriptural places that speak of sacrifices, things of that nature. And I am working on a message for you guys, specifically on God's divine plan of sacrifice. Because God had a divine will for the way sacrifices were to be offered. And as, as we would see, l l let me just, let me share with you one though here, Jeremiah. Let's take a look at this here. Let me just, I'll use the computer, it's a little faster. Let me take you to Jeremiah chapter 7. So this is something you need to think about, uh, but I, I want to. There's something I want to show you in the book of Genesis here in just a moment. But let me first, I'll real quick take you to Jeremiah. And and understand, we're going to go into this later. I, I really want to take you in depth in this. But Jeremiah chapter seven. Let's go to around verse. I think it's. Oh, excuse me. There, back up. And around verse twenty-one. And you have to ask yourself when we when I read this to you. Is this a contradiction in the Word of God or something else going on that we're not aware of? Let's start with verse 22. That's okay. For I, for I spake not unto your fathers, nor commanded them in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt concerning burnt offerings or sacrifices. Now, if you think about that, when Moses first came and gave the Ten Commandments, there, there was no mention of sacrifices. And this is what Jeremiah is bringing out right here. He says, but this thing commanded I them, saying, Obey my voice, and I will be your God, and you shall be my people. And walk you in all the ways that I have commanded you, that it may be well unto you. But they hearkened not, nor inclined their ear, but walked in the counsels and in the, in the imagination of their evil heart, and went backward and not forward. Since the day that your fathers came forth out of the land of Egypt unto this day, I have even sent unto you all my servants the prophets daily, rising up early and sending them. Yet they hearkened not unto me, nor inclined their ear, but hardened their neck. They did worse than their fathers. Therefore thou shalt speak all these words unto them, but they will not hearken to thee. Thou shalt also call unto them, but they will not answer thee. You see, God is, God did not, according to Jeremiah, he said, I spake not unto your fathers, nor commanded them in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt concerning burnt offerings or sacrifices. Now we know that the sacrificial service, according to Levitical, uh, the Levitical, Levitical law, the book of Numbers, this all comes into being. And, but it's interesting, Moses never starts that off. Now, here's, here's one of the reasons why I believe this is, and, and we have to go to the book of Genesis to see this. So let me take you to the book of Genesis, chapter 9, I believe it is. And I want to share with you, and this may be something that you've not looked at before. Um, and it's also where rabbis and, and any of you rabbinical brethren that are listening to this video, I charge you in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, the God of Israel, I charge you to listen to this because you have misinterpreted the word of God to the people. And this is one of the reasons why these things come down to being. This is the commandment that God gave unto Noah when he first came out of the ark. If we go to verse 3, Let's just begin at verse 1. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth. The fear of you and the terror of you will be on every beast of the earth and on every bird of the sky. I don't even think the word terror is a very good word there. With everything that creeps on the ground and all the fish of the sea, into your hand they are given. Now they're given to us. But the question is, is what do we do? Even Yeshua brings this out when you read the humane uh, it's called the, uh, the Essene Humane Gospel of Jesus, you know, and I'm not saying what should be canon or not, but it's interesting in light of what we do know as canon, like Jeremiah, when he says that it was never commanded, Yeshua says the same thing in that particular book as well, that Moses never commanded it. Now, that's interesting. You, we don't have that in the four Gospels that we have, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Well, we do. We have one, Matthew, and I'll bring that out to you in just a moment as well. We do have one in there. But the thing is, is he's given them into our hand, and Yeshua said the same thing. They were given into your hands, but God wanted to see what you would do. Will you show mercy or not? All right? Now, I shared that with you recently because Yeshua says, now, what is it, Matthew... Um, I'm jumping all over the place here. 
Well, let's, let's first finish this right here, then we'll go to Matthew real quick. Then we'll get back on track about these horse riders. He says here, the, uh, the fear of the terror, okay, we already read that, with everything that creeps on the ground and all the fish of the sea, in your, your hand uh, they are given. Every moving thing that is alive shall be food for you. I will give all to you as I gave uh, the green plant. Now, it does not say that in the Hebrew language. That's sad, isn't it? Let me look this up in King James for you as well. Because this is where the scruples come in. Verse 3, Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you, even as the green herb have I given you all things. See? All right, now, let's look at verse 3 in the Hebrew language. Kol asha hu chai lechem. He never says anything about meat. He doesn't say, he just says, all the creeping things which uh, he that has a life to, to you, see I'm just translating it, it will be for food. Only the ramish, only the creeping things. He didn't say anything about the cattle. He didn't say anything about the sheep or the goats. And then why did God even permit this in the beginning? Because there was nothing on the earth left. It had been destroyed by water. So he did permit the Ramesh. The Ramesh are the creeping things. Go back to Genesis chapter uh, 2 and read it. You'll see as well. Ramesh are just the little creeping things on the earth. It's not the cattle. It's not the, 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 the animals of the field. It's not the, the cow or the ox or the sheep or the goat or the deer or any of these. These are, were not the creeping. They, they are not the Ramesh. See, God says in Revelation through John, if you add to my word or you take from it, it'll be taken from your life. He also said, whatsoever a man reaps, that shall he sow. And then you wonder why we find in the book of Revelation that God is going in, in one of the horse riders, that he's, when he takes the peace from the earth, that the, even the animals will come against the people. And, they, and, according to, and, and, and that lines up with the book of Abraham that actually says that they, you, they, you, they will become your grave. And you wonder why Israel went through what they went through. Let's look at this a little further. Then the next verse, verse 4. I'm going to read it to you in Hebrew. He says, Ach basar, but the flesh, benafshu, benafshu, with his life, demo, see, his life, his blood, loto chalu, do not eat it. So God gave he had permitted them of the creeping things. But of the animals, he said, no, don't do it. But he delivered all of it to their hands. It was, it's up to them what they want to do. Even like in the case of Moses, when they, were, when they first come out on the wilderness journey, God commands them and he says to them, what does God say there? He says to the, to the children of Israel, in the promise that he made, I have given you a land flowing with milk and honey. And when he takes them on the wilderness journey, they're eating, they're eating the bread, the manna that come down from God out of heaven. But then the children of Israel got angry. They said, all we get is this manna, 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 manna. And they said, we remember. We remember the fish. We remember the melons and all this. Well, sure. God never condemned them for the melons. What did he condemn them for? For their blood, for the blood, the lust they had for blood. When God had given a covenant, all the way back here in Genesis, did anything that has the animals, and he specifically says the animals that have his soul and his blood, you're not to eat it. Now, we find that God says then to Moses, I will send quail in. He allows that. But it's not his perfect will. Now, before we leave, here in Genesis in chapter 9, I want to share with you a little bit more though here because it's, it's very interesting. And this is something that a lot of people never even notice. Uh, let's see, I believe this, let's, uh, let's start with verse 8 now. We're dropping down just a little bit. 
Oh, but yeah, and he, then he, of course he's talking about, you know, if you take the, the, the life of a man, he'll require his life, etc. And then we get down to verse 8, it says, Then God spoke to Noah and to his sons with him, saying, Now behold, I myself do establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you and with every living creature that is with you the birds, the cattle, and every beast of the earth with you, of all that comes out of the ark, even every beast of the earth. I establish my covenant with you, and all flesh shall never again be cut off by the water of the flood. Do you realize when that rainbow covenant that appears in the sky, that covenant is not just to us as the humans? It was to the animals as well. Right here, God says it in Genesis. He made it to Noah, his sons. And he says, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the cattle, and every beast of the earth with you, of the, comes out of the ark, even of every beast of the earth. Now he doesn't mention the Ramesh when he says this. The creeping things. Isn't that interesting? The Ramesh is not mentioned here, but all the other animals are. And they're given the same covenant of life. So it's through time and through sin that these other things come into being. And, and, and it's interesting because when we begin to look at books that they never allowed in the canon of the Bible, they, they line up with a lot of the things that the prophet said that were against these things. And we'll go into this later. I'll go into it later with you because I want to go into it very deeply with you. And, and now before we leave this, let me take you, as I said, I, I promise you I'll take you over to the book of Matthew. I want to share this with you. And, and keep in mind, my friends, I realize many of you, you know, that would say, you know, well, God, God permitted it. God says we can have this and God says we can have that, you know. I'm not here to argue anything on a permissive will. A permissive will of God is not his perfect will. And I'm not going to say how you eat or how you don't eat. I'm just telling you the perfect way, the way it was, like in the Garden of Eden. God gave them of all the trees of the fruit to eat. It's the way it was. The cattle were eating the grass of the fields. It's the way it was, the way God set it up. God blessed them, Adam and Eve, as well as the cattle of the field and the animals. He blessed them, said, be fruitful and multiply. How could God curse something that he's blessed? We have to think about these things now. Yeshua, though, in our own canon, in the book of Matthew, really brings out a remarkable uh, thought on this. And let's take this. We'll go to Matthew. I've got it written down here somewhere. Let me just quickly find it. Uh, I think it's Matthew 12, but let me just... I, 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 I got ahead of myself. Sorry about that. Start with verse 4. How he entered into the house of God and did eat the shoe bread, which is lawful unto him to eat, neither for them which are with him, but only for the priest. Or have you not read in the law how that on the Sabbath days the priest in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? But I say unto you that is in the place is one greater than the temple. But if you had known what this meaneth, I will have mercy and not sacrifice, you would have not condemned the guiltless. Okay. A lot of commentators believe that this was dealing with Yeshua himself. But when you read this from the Hebraic version of the book of Matthew, which, by the way, is older than the Matthew that we have here, we have no original. There is no original. Uh, I think the, the book of Matthew here, the oldest thing that you can find back is when they canonize the Bible itself. We have no um, parchments for the book of Matthew. We have no parchments for Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, for that matter. The only ones that you can find fragments of parchments from that are in the Hebraic language uh, happen to be the ones that are not canonized. But I still believe that there's a lot of accuracy in these nonetheless. I just say that we don't have it. But the book of Matthew, though, there is a Hebraic version, though, that is old. And in it, it, when it brings this particular verse out, when it gets there, it says, but if you had known what this meaneth, I will have mercy and not sacrifice, you would have not condemned the guiltless. It actually says in that one there, in the Hebrew language, you would not have bound 
the innocent. Now, the binding there in the Hebrew is in the masculine plural as well as the innocent. That's why Yeshua said, if you knew what this meaneth, I will have mercy and not sacrifice. You would have not have bound the innocent. And what did they do to the sacrifices? They bound them to the altar. And it was the males, the first. And there were females in some cases, but it was the males. So I thought, I thought that was interesting to share with you. Now, let's get back, because we were talking about the horses and their riders here. And we went to Revelation. Now, I want to go into Jeremiah 51. Uh, and the reason we're going to Jeremiah is because I saw something very interesting in Jeremiah as well. And many people believe that this is referring to the United States. And I agree with that as far as Babylon being the United States in the regards that Babylon, Rome is actually Babylon. That is the mystery Babylon. But the Babylon, because you notice here in Jeremiah, when he speaks of Babylon here, he's not speaking of mystery Babylon. Revelation speaks of mystery Babylon. That's Rome. That's the head. That's the one that is over all of this. See? But the United States comes into that because the United States is the military power. Now, there's a little key verse that's going to prove to you who they really are. Let's look at this. Let's start with verse 3 in uh, Jeremiah 51. Let not him who bends his bow and bend it not, nor let him rise up in his scale armor. So do not spare her young men. Devote all her army to destruction. They will fall down slain in the land of the Chaldeans and pierce through in their streets. For neither Israel nor Judah has been forsaken. I like that. That's letting God letting you know. Though the whole world has come against Israel, He's not forsaken them. By his, by his God, the Lord of hosts, although their land is full of guilt before the Holy One of Israel. That's another interesting point right there that Jeremiah brings out. Let's back up and read it again. For neither Israel nor Judah has been forsaken by his God, the Lord of hosts, although their land is full of guilt before the Holy One of Israel. So my Jewish brethren, there is a lot of guilt in our land, and the reason being is because we have allowed Rome to come into there. We've allowed the Vatican to have their place in Israel. And God is not pleased with this. There is a lot of guilt. There is a lot of guilt on the side that Shimon Perez has allowed this to happen. He brought Jezebel back into Israel, just like Ahab did. And instead of standing for the word of God, we continue to allow the altars of Baal to be built in Israel. And now, the Temple Institute, ready to build a third temple, instead of it being a house of prayer, they're also raising the red heifer to once again offer sacrifices unto God. And the problem is, God is not wanting the sacrifice, according to Isaiah 66. God says in Isaiah 66, if you were to kill an ox, as if you killed a man. has a lot to do with the Ten Commandments when God said, Thou shalt not kill. That word there in the Hebrew language is also synonymous with the word butcher. So he says, He's not forsaken you. But he says, Although their land is full of guilt before the Holy One of Israel, flee from the midst of Babylon and each of you save his life. And by the way, my Jewish brethren, that's for you, anywhere you are in the world, flee from Babylon. The United States is going to be destroyed as the Roman soldiers, and God is going to raise up Russia and China to do the job. It's coming. He says, flee that land. See, the, what is it? Notice how he words that in there. Flee from the midst of Babylon and each of you save his life. Do not be destroyed in her punishment for this is the Lord's time of vengeance. He is going to render recompense to her. Babylon has been a golden cup in the hand of the Lord intoxicating all the earth. The nations have drunk of her wine now you know it's wrong. 
Remember the cup that she has in her hand when she sits at Mystery Babylon and Revelation? Remember the book of Obadiah? See, what did Obadiah say about this? Obadiah identifies it as Esau. He says, Kikasher. Excuse me. Yeah, Kikasher Shotetem. Al ha Kodeshi. See? That, see, they, they, they have drunk upon my holy mountain, Mount Zion. See? What, let's back, let me read it to you in English. Because just as you drank on my holy mountain, all nations will drink continually. They will drink and swallow and become as if they had never existed. But on Mount Zion there will be those who escape, and it will be holy, and the house of Jacob will possess their possessions. Notice the holy mountain is Mount Zion. There's those that have said, Mount Zion is not holy, Brother Steve. Yes, it is. Do you know in the Essene community that Mount Zion, and not only the Essene, but I'm sorry, not the Essene, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, there is a Torah comment, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, a, a, uh, let me, let me, put, I got her name here written down somewhere here for you. She's a uh, scholar that give a lecture about the, um, who gave the lecture on the Dead Sea Scrolls recently, and very interesting lecture. Um, thought I had her name written down here somewhere, but I, I know I do, but I forget where it's at exactly. I, I will post that on Israel, Israeli News Live. I'll post that in there for you so you can see that, or try to do, if I'll try to remember to put it in the comments. But anyway, she, she worked, she, give, uh, she gave a, a lecture on, the, on the, uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls. And one of the things that she noted in the Dead Sea Scrolls was that it was very common amongst all the writings that they found that were not what we would know as canons of the Bible today, but Mount Zion was considered the holy mountain of God. No wonder why Obadiah says this here. He says, because just as you had drank on my holy mountain, Pope Francis fulfilled that scripture because that is in the masculine plural and it was only men that partook, play, took place of the communion service on Mount Zion there in the upper room. But the following mass services they had where they drank their wine, it was all nations inclusive and gender inclusive as the scripture says here. Ishatu hagoim tamid. See, and you will continually, the nations will continually drink gender inclusive, nation inclusive. And what do we have over here according to the book of Jeremiah 51? Babylon has been a golden cup in the hand of the Lord, intoxicating all the earth. See, the nations have drunk of her wine. Over here, the nations will continually drink. Obadiah, that's verse 16 for those that don't know about it. They'll continually drink. The Pope of Rome fulfilled the first sentence in the verse. When it was only men that participated in the communion of the upper room, then they went and threw the Jews out of King David's tomb. Why? Because uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu had permitted a, a, a seat for the Pope of Rome? An official seat at the tomb of David? You've made him your Jewish king, the Pope of Rome, the Vicar of Christ, the Antichristo. My gosh. Therefore the nations are going mad, it says. Suddenly Babylon has fallen and been broken. Notice that. Therefore the nations are going mad. It's not just the United States. It's the nations. See, Babylon is greater than just the U.S. The U.S. is part of this. But the nations are going mad. Why? Because they drink with her. Suddenly Babylon has fallen and been broken. Wail over her. Bring balm for her pain. Perhaps she may be healed. See, we, we applied healing to Babylon, but she was not healed. Forsake her and let us each go to his own country. For her judgment has reached to heaven and towers up to the very skies. The Lord brought us about our vindication. Come and let us rec uh, recount in Zion the work of the Lord our God. My Jewish brethren... This is Jeremiah 51 is a command for you to come home. Go to Mount Zion and count the blessings that God has done for us. Makes me wonder why God showed me in this dream sometime back about a year ago. He shows me the dream, the man drinking on the mountain of God. He says, there's a man drinking on my holy mountain. 
you're to remove him. I'm, I'm not anybody. I don't know what, you know. This is nuts. For, I mean, Lord, forgive me. I don't want to say nuts. God, show me something I, don't, I just don't understand. And I was on Mount Zion. Right there, just like God showed it. Let's drop down to verse uh, 11. Sharpen the arrows, fill the quivers. The Lord has aroused the spirit of the kings of the Medes because his purpose against Babylon to destroy it. For it is the vengeance of the Lord, vengeance for his temple. That is proof who Babylon is. For the vengeance of his temple. Now again, Babylon, her armies, does include the United States because that's her military power. God is going to bring down all of Babylon. But in this case here, because of the vengeance for his temple, well, again, we go back to the book of Obadiah and we find out what God means. Verse 6, Oh, how Esau will be ransacked and his hidden treasures searched out. All men allied with you will send you forth to the border. All the men that are allied with you, confederate with you, I believe, is in the King James. That's Psalm 83. The tents of Edom are confederate with you, and the, uh, you know, the, and the names of the Arab nations as well. The tents, by the way, of Edom are the churches of Rome that have come back, joined in with the mother whore of Revelation. See? But he, he's, Esau is, is going to be ransacked. Now, verse 8, Will I not on that day, declares the Lord, destroy the wise men from Adam? And understanding from the Mount of Esau, then your mighty men will be dismayed, O Teman, so that everyone may be cut off from the mountain of Esau by slaughter. You won't even be able to get back to Rome no more. Now he's talking about killing all the soldiers of Rome. Because of the violence of your brother Jacob, you will be covered with shame and you will be cut off forever. On the day that you stood aloof, on the day that the strangers carried of his wealth and the foreigners entered into his gate and cast lots of Jerusalem, you too were as one of them. Titus, the Roman general. Do not gloat over your brother's day, the day of his misfortune, and do not rejoice over the sons of Judah in the day of their destruction. Yes, do not boast in the day of their distress. Do not enter into the gate of my people in the day of their disaster. Yes, you do not gloat over their calamity. Now, actually, let me look at that in the King James for you real quick. This... For thy violence, verse 10, for thy violence against thy brother Jacob, shame shall cover thee, and thou shalt be cut off forever. In the day that thou stoodest on the other side, or aloof, see, in the day that the strangers carried away captive his forces, and foreigners entered into his gates and cast lots upon Jerusalem, even thou wast one of them. That was Titus the Roman general. It's speaking of the destruction of 70 AD. See, he even names Judah. But thou shouldst not have looked on the day of thy brother in the, in the day of, uh, they became a stranger. Neither shouldst thou have rejoiced over the children of Judah in the day of their destruction. Neither shouldst thou have spoken proudly in the day of distress. That is 70 A.D. clearly being identified. Clearly. So when God says in the book of Jeremiah in chapter 51, what is he speaking about? He says in verse 11, dropping down halfway in the verse, because his purpose against Babylon is to destroy it, for it is the vengeance of the Lord, vengeance for his temple. For the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. And actually not just the temple there, but also because the Romans destroyed and killed the early Christians. The Roman Catholic Church, Constantine and what he put together was not the church of God. That was a bunch of pagans of a Mithras religion that came together that formed the first church known as the Catholic Church. And they murdered the true believers, the true Jewish believers that believed Yeshua to be Mashiach. They were all murdered. And of course, many of the books were burned so that we never could see really a lot of the things that Yeshua spoke about. And no doubt that the Catholic Church has a lot of those hidden in their archives as well. But that is not going to be made known to us. Anyway, 
in concluding this, we realize the time is coming. God is going to restore His Word. Judgment is going to come upon the land. He'll send His two witnesses. This is where the judgment will really come in. After their death, though, when they're killed in the streets of Egypt, or in the streets of Jerusalem there, right outside the Damascus Gate is where it says, also our Lord was crucified. The two witnesses will be killed there. As it said, Sodom and Egypt. Egypt because why? Rome has gotten complete control of it. Sodom because, like what Lot dealt with, Jerusalem becomes a Sodomite city. And of course, much like Lot in his day, the rabbinical leaders are not crying out against it. Well, you may cry out against it, but it's not changing anything. It'll take God to bring the judgment. And of course, violence of our own accord is not the way to do it. But the two witnesses, God will bring down the miraculous things. Let me, in closing, let me just share with you from the book of Exodus the prophecy that is yet to be fulfilled. And I've really always loved this. Exodus chapter 34, verse 10. And he said, Behold, I make a covenant before all thy people. I will do marvels. Actually, the word is wonders in Hebrew. Such as have not been done in all the earth, nor in any nation. And all the people among which thou art shall see the work of the Lord. For it is a terrible thing that I will do with thee. Observe thou which thou hast command thee this day. Behold, I drive out before thee the Amorite, the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Perizzite, and the Hivite, and the Jebusite. Take heed to thyself, lest thou take a, make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, whether thou goest, lest it be for a snare in the midst of thee. But you shall destroy their altars, break their images, and cut down their groves. For thou shalt worship no other god, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. Lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, and they go a whoring after other gods. Moses will return with Elijah. Eliyahu began Moshe. And God will tear down the altars then. And it won't be that they just go up there and knock them over and nothing like that, no. Maybe earthquakes and things like that. Whatever the, whatever the plagues is that they speak, that God will command through them as often as they will, as the Bible says. This will bring the judgments of Almighty God. In fact, the two witnesses... There will, there will be no announcement needed. There will be nobody trying to figure out who they are because the world will actually hate them because these things that will happen will become a global epidemic. They talk about a climate chaos coming in September. And who knows what they really mean by this, the French, prime, or the French uh, foreign minister that made this statement. But one thing is for sure, there is a global climate chaos coming. That'll be when the two witnesses are on the scene. I'm Stephen Benoon with the Noon Institute of Biblical Research. Shalom and good evening. Shabbat shalom.